Good morning. Welcome to the Friday, December 10th, 2010 edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, your host for the next hour. You're listening to LibertyRadioLive.com. Thanks for joining the broadcast this morning. Yesterday, I concluded the reading of what I consider to be one of the most valuable books that have been published lately to help us understand the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order, Code Word Barbalon by P.D. Stewart. And we've been in the reading and discussion of that book for a considerable period of time. I don't remember the date that I started reading that book. But it was quite a while. I um, even debated whether I could keep my audience interested in one single book for that length of time. It's a rather lengthy book. But I decided to read it anyway and use it, as one of my listeners says, an outline for discussion. And I think it worked quite well. If you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, I'm sure you gleaned a great deal of knowledge from that book. And I, after finishing the book, I got so into the book and what I'd learned from it. When I finished the book yesterday, I had, I kind of went into the doldrums. What am I going to do tomorrow? Well, the natural, the natural suggestion came to me, well, you ought to read the second book, Code Word Barbalon 2. Antichrist is a woman alive and well again. But I'd just like to say I think God had other plans. Now, if you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, you know that I've discovered over a period of 20 years some things in the Bible that are not consistent with what the church teaches. And I'm speaking specifically about the 70th week of Daniel. The, you know, the so-called seven years of great tribulation, when the Jews will be back in their ancient homeland, Israel, and that there will be a temple built, and there will be a peace treaty signed, a seven-year peace treaty that will presumably allow the Jews to, unlike today, have access to Temple Mount and build a temple and actually start animal sacrifices again, and that after three and a half years, this Antichrist figure will violate that treaty, somehow violate that treaty. And, uh, well, what we learn in our futurist churches, this is the future 70th week of Daniel. And I was stunned to discover that that interpretation comes from Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. And... that it's a lie. It's a twisting of that scripture. Now, if I'm going to discuss this further, I'm going to have to require my listeners to do something that's very, very difficult. And that is, like I told my sister one time in a discussion like this, you have to take off the church's glasses. Just reach up there and grab them by the bows and pull them straight off your face. It's real easy to do. Just, it's not as difficult as it sounds. Just take off the church's glasses for a moment. And we're going to do a little exercise. We're going to require my listeners to do a, just a bit of work this morning. First of all, we're going to read... 
Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 through 27 again. I know we've focused on it with Bill Hughes. we focused on it with Nicholas Arthur. And I've focused on it myself. And maybe you don't want to hear it again, but in preparation for what I feel led to do, after reading Code Word Barbalon, we need to review Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27 again. So get out your Bibles or get out your e-swords and turn with me to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. And then also, while you're at it, get out a piece of paper and a pencil, because we're going to do a little math. Oh, it's just simple addition. It's not going to be difficult. I hate math, too. But don't freak out on me. No complex algebra or calculus. Just simple mathematics. Just simple addition of of uh, double-digit numbers. Real easy stuff. Now, we're going to do all this in preparation for reading a book entitled Exploding the Israel Deception by Steve Wolberg. A very, very eye-opening book that is consistent with the thesis that we're about to discover in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. But before I read that book, it's going to be necessary for us to review again chapter 9, verse 27 of the book of Daniel. And I'll begin with that now. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 says, listen carefully, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Now let's break it down. First of all, if you've got your piece of paper and pencil handy, I want you to write down Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, and then 70 weeks. Okay, that's the heading. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, and 70 weeks. Now, we have to understand that a week in prophetic time, in this particular case, represents seven literal years. Okay, so 70 weeks would be 490 literal years. So where you have written Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 and 70 weeks, put after that put an equal sign and then put 490 years. Make sure you don't lose sight of the fact of what a week represents. A week represents seven literal years. Seventy weeks equals 490 years. Just simple mathematics, nothing difficult. Now let's, let's talk about verse 24 again. Seventy weeks this period of 490 years are determined upon thy people. Now, who were Daniel's people? The Jews, right? The Israelites who were in Babylonian captivity. All right. They were in Babylonian captivity. They were the Jewish people, the Israelitish people. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people, the Israelites, and upon thy holy city. What was Daniel's holy city? 
It was Jerusalem. Now it says, to finish the transgression. There was a transgression he was talking about. They're going to bring an end to a certain transgression. Now we have to remember that Israel had been living in sin, bowing down and worshiping images and idols. We remember in Ezekiel chapter 8 that they had erected on Temple Mount an image that provoked God to jealousy. Okay? God forbid in his second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image and bow down and worship it. But that's what the Israelites had done. And also the women sat on the steps of the temple weeping for Tammuz. All right, Tammuz is the sun god, the son of the sun god, the incarnate, virgin-born son of the sun god, Nimrod. We've talked about that before. If you're unfamiliar with it, you know, we, we talk about it a lot, so... But Tammuz was essentially Baal worship. It was sun worship. And the women would traditionally weep for Tammuz, who was slain, and they mourned 40 days. That was the pagan tradition. The worship of Tammuz was 40 days of mourning because of his death. And that's where we get Lent today. Lent, L-E-N-T. That is what is celebrated in the Roman Catholic Church. And that's what's being taught in some of the so-called Protestant churches today, as my sister attests to. Going to a Pentecostal church, not 30 miles from me, was being taught... Lent, that's 40 days of lamentation and weeping for Tammuz. We know this in history. This was another one of the abominations that the Israelites were connect, were, were, were uh, engaged in that provoked God to jealousy. They were worshiping another God, the sun God. And... They worshipped an image. They stood up on Temple Mount, an image, a statue, if you will, that they that they idolized and worshipped. And also the men stood with their backs toward the temple, facing east, worshipping the rising sun. In other words, they were standing with their backs toward the Holy of Holies. They they turned their backs on the God of glory, the Creator. They turned the opposite direction, faced east, and worshipped the rising sun. Now, all the things that I've just described are typical of Baal worship. That's what they were doing. They were worshipping Baal. Just another name for Nimrod. Just another name for Tammuz. And obviously they were, they had a statue erected. And I'm inclined to believe that that was a, a statue of the goddess of the Queen of Heaven, Semiramis, the virgin, the ever virgin Queen of Heaven, the mother and wife of Nimrod or Tammuz. It's Baal worship. It's all connected. Forty days of weeping, worshiping of a of, 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 of female deity, the queen of heaven, and the sun god. It's all there. And it's embodied lock, stock, and barrel in Catholicism today. There's virtually no difference. They were practicing Catholicism, if you will. Now, obviously, the word Catholicism wasn't in use at that time. 
the Roman Catholic Church wasn't in existence in that time. But what's in the name? They were worshiping the same way. All right. That was the transgression. The transgression is worshiping another god and not the god of creation. Not worshiping according to the express command of the Creator, and doing that which God most abhors, and that is having another God before him, bowing down and worshiping images and idols, and taking his name in vain, and also observing another, a different Sabbath than the seventh-day Sabbath. In other words, Israel was violating all four of God's holy laws in the first table of the Ten Commandments. That was the transgression. And whenever Israel transgressed against the Lord, this is what they did. Okay? They were going to be punished for this. That's why they were sent to Babylonian captivity. If you're going to worship like a Baal worshiper, if you're going to worship like a Babylonian, then go to Babylon and do it. Don't do it on my holy hill in Jerusalem. They had defiled the city of peace. They had defiled themselves with images and idols. And God punished them, rightly punished them for what they did. Babylonian captivity. Daniel finds himself in Babylon reviewing the sins of his nation and making confession to the Lord. And that's when God heard his prayer and sent the angel to give him this vision. The 70 weeks of Daniel. 490 years are determined upon your people, Israel, Daniel, and upon your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish the transgression, to worship me in spirit and in truth, and stop this blasted Baal worship. I want you to know me, not Satan's counterfeit. You are being punished for doing that which I forbid you to do, you and the whole nation of Israel, in this Babylonian captivity, because you were worshiping as did the Babylonians. Babylon. Seventy weeks were determined upon the Jewish nation and upon the city of Jerusalem to finish this transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Now, let's stop and talk about that phrase. What is it to make reconciliation for iniquity? First of all, who do we need to be reconciled to? God, right? When did we lose favor with God? At the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve, instead of obeying the command of the Lord, ate of the tree that God forbid them to eat. That's where iniquity came into the world. That's when the the human race, I hate that term, that's when man fell. That's when death prevailed over man. Disobedience caused the death of man, the spiritual and physical death of man. That's when the that's when the 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 intimacy and the contact between man and the Creator was ended. That's when the fellowship was broken. God wishes that we be reconciled to him and what reconciles what keeps us from being reconciled to him is our iniquity 
And we've always determined that the iniquity is violating God's law. Iniquity is sin, and sin is the violation of the law. So the phrase reconciliation for iniquity is reunion in obedience and fellowship with the Creator. What we're really talking about is redemption. We're talking about full redemption, a full restoration. And I might suggest, some might argue, but I might suggest to regain the position that we had before Adam and Eve sinned. Okay? Whatever that was, they didn't know they were naked. Because they weren't naked, they were clothed. They were clothed with righteousness. Okay, they didn't traipse around the the Garden of Eden naked and just were too stupid to know they were naked. No, they were clothed. They were clothed in righteousness. Now, whether that was a robe of light or what, I don't know. I'm not going to add to God's Word, but I know one thing. When they sinned, they realized they were naked and they they scrambled and tried to fashion aprons to cover their nakedness. But that wasn't good enough. They couldn't cover. They couldn't adequately cover their sins. They couldn't make reconciliation of their own. Somebody else had to do it for them. Someone who had never sinned. Someone who was perfect and someone who was given the mission to make reconciliation. And who was it but the Creator Himself who found them naked in the garden and asked them, Did you eat of the tree that I commanded you not to eat? How did you know you were naked? And then He did something miraculous. He covered them with skins. Now, where did he get the skins? He had to make sacrifice. And right then and there in the Garden of Eden, he set forth his plan of redemption. That he would take a perfect lamb without spot or blemish and make reconciliation for iniquity. And as a temporary cover, he ritualistically used an innocent animal, a lamb, slain before the foundation of the world and covered Adam and Eve. And that was their temporary covering. It also contained within it the answer to the reconciliation of iniquity. And that's what our Messiah did for us. He reconciled us to God. He reconciled us from our iniquity and brought us back into fellowship with the Creator. Now, returning to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Remembering that Christ, as he walked in the garden with Adam and Eve, clothed them with skins. He made an animal sacrifice, clothed them with skins, a a temporary covering. And this they did, animal sacrifices. We know the story that Cain and Abel made sacrifices. Cain made a sacrifice of his own hands, and it was rejected. Abel made a sacrifice with understanding. He, too, used a spotless lamb out of his own flocks, spotless and without blemish, knowing that Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and his sacrifice was acceptable to the Lord. Now, that system was a schoolmaster. Animal sacrifices was a typification of what Christ would literally do himself when he came to redeem man, to make reconciliation for iniquity. 
to put an end of sins, to finish the transgressions. In the meantime, animal sacrifices sufficed. And if done correctly, if not deviating like Cain did, the meaning would be held intact. And Abel kept the meaning and the understanding of what Christ would literally do sometime down the, in the future. He kept that sacrifice. He did not deviate from the example that Christ gave Adam and Eve. All right. It is Christ who is the Lamb. He had not yet died for the sins of the world, but he put a down payment. He made a promise. I will come, the spotless lamb. I will be born of a virgin. I will live a sinless life. I will be the perfect lamb of God. I will give up my life, and by that shedding of blood, I myself will redeem you to the Father. There's nothing you can do. You can't sew aprons together of leaves and to cover your nakedness. You are incapable of redeeming yourself to God. That's my job. Let me do it. And in the meantime, until I come, this is what you do. To remember the promise that I made you, that I am your lamb and I will do this for you. So they made animal sacrifices and hoping for the promise of that one time, once and for all, all efficacious sacrifice of Christ himself, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That's how you make reconciliation for iniquity. That's how you bring in everlasting righteousness. Now, what is everlasting righteousness? Well, Christ is our righteousness. And we're told that he's going to set up a kingdom that will never end. In other words, it's everlasting. Everlasting righteousness in this passage refers to the kingdom of Christ, in my view. And is it not indeed Christ who will bring in his kingdom? Everlasting righteousness? and to seal up the vision and the prophecy? Fulfillment in Christ. And it happened 2,000 years ago. And the last phrase in this is, talks about to anoint the most holy. And we know that at the end of or near the end, within seven years of the end of this 490-year period, this 70 weeks, which are determined upon Israel, the Israelites and upon Jerusalem, that the Most Holy would be anointed. That is Christ himself, and he was anointed by, the, by John the Baptist in the river. And we know, because the Holy Spirit descended upon him, and the voice heard from the heavens, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, do we look in the future for that fulfillment, or do we look in the past? Do we look into the future, or do we look into history? We look to history. That's the only way you can see Bible prophecy being fulfilled, is to look in history. We know of other prophecies that Daniel got, was given of the Lord. He was given the vision of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the metal man image, the head of gold, the, 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 the arms and breast of silver, the thighs of bronze, and the two legs of iron. Those were the four successive Gentile world empires that would culminate with the return of Christ. Now, do we look in the future for the fulfillment of that, or do we look in the past? We look in the past. It's the only way you can see Bible prophecy being fulfilled. 
We know that those four world empires were in succession, that the Babylonians fell to the Medo-Persians, the Medo-Persians fell to the Greeks, and the Greeks fell to the Romans. And the Romans were in power at the time our Lamb was born. It was the end of days when Christ was born. It was during the time of the fourth and final kingdom that kingdom of iron that stamped upon the residue and broke in pieces. And it was a brutal empire, the culmination of an, of an escalation of brutality and paganism, the Roman Empire. All right, now well, let's go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. We know that we look to history to see if Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. Now he says, now therefore, know therefore and understand. We're going to do some math here. That from the going forth of the commandment to restore, to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. Now none of us need to be told what Jerusalem is and none of us need to be told who the Messiah the Prince is shall be seven weeks. Okay, write down seven weeks. Put it in brackets. Seven weeks. And then off to the side, write 49 literal years. <clears throat> seven weeks equals seven periods of seven years. Seven times seven is forty-nine. All right. It continues, and three score and two weeks. That's sixty-two weeks. A score is twenty. Three score is sixty. And two more weeks is sixty-two weeks. That's four hundred and eighty-three years. So write down... 62 weeks in brackets below where you wrote 7 weeks. Now, to the side of that, 483 years. 62 times 7 is 483. Now, you add them together, you get 400 and... Excuse me, I messed that up already. When you add the seven weeks and the 62 weeks, you get 483 years. Now, he's taken this 483 years. Now, remember, we're talking about a, a total of 490 altogether. So there's seven years we haven't even talked about yet. That's one week. That's called the 70th week of Daniel. But he's taken the first 69 weeks and broke them down into two separate periods, two distinct periods. We know from history that the first seven weeks, or the first 49 years, was to restore Jerusalem. And that after that period, a 62-week period began, the end of which... Messiah would come at the end of the 69th week. So we're talking about 69 weeks. It would take 69 prophetic weeks to restore Jerusalem and then for Messiah the Prince to come. All right. Let's read it again. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks to restore Jerusalem and then an additional three score and two weeks till the Messiah the Prince comes. And it's, that's totaling 69 weeks. 
And it says, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. It was just letting Daniel know that all of this would be, in, all of this would occur in troublous times. Now, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 says, And after three score and two weeks, remember, this 69-week period that we've just been discussing, the four, or the seven Weeks or 49 years, and the 62 weeks are broken into two different segments, altogether totaling 69 weeks. So, in other words, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26 is talking about that second period, 62 weeks. It says, after 62 weeks, which is just as easily said to say that after the 69th week, since Jerusalem is already restored, after the 69th week shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the era end thereof shall be with a flood." And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now that takes us all the way up to the to seventy A.D. All right, seven weeks to restore Jerusalem. From that point, sixty-two weeks till Messiah the Prince. Altogether, sixty-nine weeks of years with one week to go, one seven-year period to go, the 70th week of Daniel. And during that last week, that 70th week, after the Messiah has come and been anointed, he shall be cut off. He shall be killed but not for himself. He's going to be killed for you and me. Just like the lamb that was slain for Adam and Eve. Just like the lamb that that, uh, Abel slew. He would be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He would fulfill what he promised to do. At the end of the 69th week, it says, after... Not before, not during, but after the three score and two weeks. In other words, after the 69th week, remembering that it it took seven weeks to restore Jerusalem, shall Messiah be cut off. It doesn't say how long after, but we're going to get to that. Now, Messiah shall be cut off in that 70th week, but not for himself, for you and me. And then the prince of uh, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who destroyed the city and the sanctuary? The Romans, 70 A.D. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, you ask me, Who were these people? Well, it was Titus's 10th legion. They were Romans. At least Titus was a Roman. And they worked for Caesar. And there is a prince, a Caesar, that shall come. He is the biblical Antichrist. He is the one who stood up when Constantine left Rome and beat feet for Byzantium, and the prince of darkness stood up in his place, the Pope of Rome. This phrase, the the prince that shall come, refers to Antichrist. Write it down. Don't confuse this man with the Lamb. It says, the people of the prince that shall come, 
the people of the Antichrist, the Romans, they did come and they destroyed the city and the sanctuary in 70 A.D. And the end thereof, that is the city and the sanctuary, the temple in Jerusalem, came in with a flood. Not one stone was left upon another. Total destruction. The city was besieged, the people starved, finally taken over, and total desolation for Jerusalem. And it says, under the end of the war, desolations are determined. All right, that ended Jerusalem. 70 A.D. Now, here's the big problem. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. The question is, who is this he who is spoken of in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27? Now, this is where you need to take off the church's glasses. So do that for me now, will you? Just reach up, grab them by the bows, and pull them straight off. Because this is where we're going to depart from what we're taught in the churches. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is where the church has been telling you this Antichrist figure will confirm a covenant with the Jews for one week. Sometime way off in the future. And in the midst of the week, he'll cause the sacrifices and the oblations to cease. In other words, he'll break the treaty that he made with the Jews so they could start animal sacrifices again, right? And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even to the consummation. And that determination should be poured out by the, upon the desolate. That's what you've been taught. You've been taught that this he represents the Antichrist. The truth of the matter is, who this he really represents can be seen clearly in history, in the life of Christ himself. The he who you have always been taught, right here, the second word in this verse, and he... This he you have always been taught represents the Antichrist. This is not Antichrist. This is Christ himself. Now, the prophecy teachers will come and say, well, what was the antecedent? Let's go back and check to see who this he is. So they go back to the passage. It says, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So it must be talking about this prince, right? And we know the prince is the Antichrist, the Roman Antichrist. So this he down here must be the Antichrist. Let me show you the fallacy of that. The principal subject of that phrase, and the people of the prince that shall come... The antecedent of the word he in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27 is not, as is taught in the churches, the prince that shall come, but the people. It's talking about the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The Antichrist didn't destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people of the Antichrist. The Romans destroyed the city and the sanctuary. This is all about the people, not the prince. So we know this because the word he in Daniel 9.27 cannot refer to the people. You can't use he to describe people. The antecedent to this word he is the people. It doesn't work. So they apply it to the prince that shall come. That's wrong. 
And trust me, this is what I believed for 50 years of my life, that this word he, this little two-word he in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, represents the prince that shall come. But a careful reading lets you know that he's not the subject of that of that phrase. The prince that shall come is not the subject of that phrase. It is the people. And the word he cannot refer to people. So it's not talking about the prince that shall come, the Antichrist. It's talking about another he. It's talking about Christ himself. We're talking about the one who would be anointed by the Most Holy who would finish the transgression, who would make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy. The anointed one shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Why just one week? Because there were only 70 weeks determined or set aside for Israel and Jerusalem. And the 16, and the Messiah <clears throat> would come after the 69th week. Now, seven, 69 from 70 leaves one week, right? This passage, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, is talking about that week the 70th week. Now, who confirmed a covenant with the Jews during that last 70th week? Did the Antichrist confirm a covenant with the Jews in that last 70th week? No, it was Christ himself. Antichrist had not come yet. Antichrist was yet in the future. Remember, Paul said... He that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then that wicked shall be revealed. Who was he talking about? He was talking about the Caesar. The Roman Caesar would be taken out of the way, and then the man of sin would be revealed. And who was that? The Pope of Rome, the, the prince that shall come. The Roman. But he didn't come in the 70th week. He didn't come in that last and final week that was determined for Israel and Jerusalem. And it was he who confirmed a covenant, a covenant in his blood. And in the midst of that 70th week, after three and a half years, after being anointed by John in the River Jordan, he became the sacrifice, and he caused the sacrifices and the oblation to cease. He was the lamb. No more lambs ever to be slain. We'll continue with this Monday. It's important that you understand this. Thanks for listening.